Hey, I'm Dave, and I am uh, going to go through the SEC versus Ripple case, um, read through the decision that came out yesterday. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a legal expert. I'm basically uh, your average American techno enthusiast, technology enthusiast. I like techno music, too. This is about technology. I understand deeply how um, this technology that is un, uh, being questioned here, how, how it works. And I think it's important to look at it kind of from a non-legal perspective, from a logical, technical perspective to see what's being said here. And Judge Torres does a really good job of laying out really specific examples and um, uh, giving good explanations of why certain decisions were reached. Overall, I've only read about half of it, so I'm going to go through so, sort of live here. I'll pause and skip around. I'm not going to just read through the whole thing. Um, but it seems overall good for America. Uh, overall good for, like, it's nothing near what we feared it was going to be. I'm sure the SEC will appeal because they're babies. Um, but this this seems kind of good so far for um, national security. I'll say, and for economic relevance in the world going forward, to be allowed to participate as Americans and for business owners to be able to build with this new tech so they can compete with their, um, well, with their competition. So I'm going to pause and then the rest of this video should just be me skipping through with little points that I see. Some of them will be nitpicky. Some of them will be, um, I don't know, maybe not interesting to you and just interesting to me. I also am going to be going through a little bit from the perspective of somebody who's paying close attention to the next case coming around with the SEC versus Dragon Chain. So that one is, um, you know, it's got its own unique properties to it. And based on what this is saying, I'm optimistic at their odds. It's a different circuit with different judges and stuff. So um, I don't know if it'll have to go to the Supreme Court if there's disagreement you know, between different um, different judges and stuff on how uh, the U.S. law is should be interpreted. But anyway, yeah, there's a couple of things in here that I think are directly re relevant to the Dragon Chain case. I don't know how or, you know, if they can be used, but they're at least interesting. And I'll try to point those along the way, point those out along the way as well. Um, yeah, and that's it. And I'll probably, you know what, here, I'll edit in a QR code right here for uh, Dragon Chain's legal defense. If you want to look into how you can help continue, use this as momentum to continue the fight for businesses to be allowed to operate in the U.S. using this technology. I'll also put a link in whatever comments or, you know, post below that kind of thing. So right off the bat, I'll be a little bit nitpicky. Um, I won't go way into it, but <clears throat> the language used, and this is where maybe the legal community and the engineering community needs to come together and have a conversation about reality and how things really are uh, working under the hood, because technically, um, and this is page one, paragraph one, the end of it, the last sentence says that uh, each unit or drop of XRP is fungible with any other unit or drop. Um, that isn't technically true. Fungibility is a little bit complicated, but it's the idea that any one unit can be exchanged for any other unit, and there's no difference between them. They have the same properties, they have the same value, um, nobody is going to be able to distinguish one from the other, so there's no way they can have any uh, different values, that kind of thing. Um, if you have something like Monero, or something like Zcash, a tr private transaction with that, with uh, privacy coins, things like that, where you cannot see the history <clears throat> of a coin, where it's been, uh, who's had it, that kind of thing, then that would be true. XRP is more of a Bitcoin style ledger where it's completely transparent. So what you can do is you can see exactly where a token came from, uh, who sold it, who they got it from, how much is being transferred between two accounts, that kind of thing. And it's, like I said, it's nitpicky, sort of splitting hairs, but it violates fungibility, and I don't think that the word fungible should have been used as a, as a vocabulary term here 
because of it, um, if I sell you a cup of coffee and you're an arms dealer, all of a sudden I'm associated with you. The tokens that you gave me are quote unquote dirty, right? And now I have to be concerned about being associated with uh, some bullshit that I never knew about. That isn't fungibility. I can't trust that a token is fungible because I have to consider, for example, um, the DEA loves people committing crimes in Bitcoin rather than dollars because they can track Bitcoin. Uh, they can't track dollars dropped in an alley in a back alley somewhere as easily as they can with an open ledger. So I would take issue with XRP being called fungible. That's all I really want to say about that. I don't think it it might not even matter when it's applied to this particular case, but it matters to me. Okay, so the meat of the argument. There are four different instances, completely separate things that the court is evaluating, um, where the SEC is claiming that Ripple or Garlinghouse or somebody involved with that community sold securities that were unregistered with the SEC. Those are... Um, institutional sales they call it institutional sales this is like i don't know selling to banks and shit right investors where they have an agreement for something and it's an institutional sale to a, a, a whatever they deem is an institutional sale that's the category anyway uh the second category is what they're calling programmatic sales this is like on an exchange this is like uh you're selling to anybody who wants to buy it and you don't know who they are. You're not, you don't even meet them. You don't have any idea who they are. You don't care how much or how little they buy. It's just available and anybody can show up and buy it. That's programmatic sales. There's also where Ripple distributed XRP as a form of payment for services, or they call this other distributions. This is where um, if you mow my lawn and uh, I pay you in Ripple, is that a security? Right? Am I paying you? Am I am I violating securities law by paying you with an unregistered security if I choose to pay you in chickens or in this case XRP? And then there's the fourth category that isn't really defined here, I think, but there's another category where it is uh, personal sales from um, like Garling House and things like that. They they talk about that. This this document talks about that as if it's separate. So I think technically there's only three categories but it, in reality there's four the fourth being uh, personal sales by members team members of ripple um, is that a security so those are the four things that we're looking at each of them is um, gone into separately by the court and there's reasoning in here and we'll get into that next all right 11 pages in and i found something worth saying this is about the concept of a an investment contract I've seen a lot of stuff where people are arguing what is and what is not an investment contract. This is saying that an investment contract isn't necessarily a contract. It doesn't have to be a written contract. It doesn't have to be um, a formally agreed upon contract to be considered an investment contract by the courts. You've probably heard the Howey test cited a zillion times. Um, but in this paragraph, <clears throat> it's cited, and then there's some case law where it expands on it. So, SEC versus Howey, there's a quote where it says, The contract, transaction, or scheme whereby a person invests his money in a common enterprise and is led to expect profits solely from the efforts of the promoter or a third party. And then go on, goes on to say, from case law in 1967, that form should be disregarded for substance and the emphasis should be on economic reality and the totality of circumstances. So this is getting into, and there's more, you know, a few pages of it, I think, but basically this is getting into tearing apart the idea that an investment contract has to be a formal written contract or a formally agreed upon contract to be an investment contract. An investment contract, it looks like, is now just a term that is used uh, independent of, well, of form, right? But it says right here, form should be disregarded for substance. I think that's interesting, and I think that'll probably be used a lot going forward to clarify that definition. Um, 
Also, I'll point out, because this is going to come up in a minute too, uh, led to expect profit solely from the efforts of the promoter or a third party. And that's important for a reason I haven't gotten into yet, but I'll, I'll be back with that in a minute. There is a defense of existing law that outlines the purpose or the intent of um, the Howey test. And that is that it was intended to embody a flexible rather than a, st a static principle, one that is capable of adapting to the countless and variable schemes devised by those who seek the use of money and others and of others on the promise of profits. The countless and variable schemes devised. This, I would say, is arguing against the idea that old law uh, cannot be used to um, handle new technology, that it's obsolete, that it, we need new law. Um, this is actually something that that Gensler has been arguing for about uh, in front of Congress and stuff, saying, no, the laws that exist are fine. We can just use existing law to manage this technology. We don't need new rules and stuff, which... Could be true. Um, yeah. I don't know exactly what else to say about that, except that, you know, if that's true, then... Um, well. Yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true if we're fair about it, right? This is where, this is where I have uh, maybe some questions about... Who's interpreting that law? The interpretation of it. I'm rambling now, so that's it. I don't have anything else interesting to say. I shouldn't have even shouldn't have even chimed in with that one. On to the next one. On page 14, we discover uh, that there is clarification on what can be a security. Some people would argue that uh, something is a, a commodity, not a security, but um, Section 2, the analysis section on page 14, actually points out that commodities can be also securities, and it depends on how they're sold and what agreements they're sold under. So it's circumstantial. You can sell gold as a security if it includes an investment contract. And it points out um, cases where commodities have been used as securities in the past to back that up. Orange groves, obviously, Howie, whiskey casks, pay phones, condominiums, beavers, and digital tokens. Uh, they cite the Telegram case here because if you remember uh, SEC versus Telegram, um, they, had, they took issue with their Gram token and uh, deemed that that was a security. So interesting to note, uh, commodities can be securities if you sell them that way. So be careful what kind of agreements you enter into if you're going to be selling things to people. A little bit more on investment contracts. Um, Howie says that an investment contract can be a contract, a transaction, or a scheme, any of those things, to be considered an investment contract, and that a scheme has to be evaluated um, with a full set of contracts, expectations, and understandings centered on the sale and distribution. I think that that's very important because a lot of things that the SEC has done has been to cherry pick information, to not uh, consider the full scope or all the facts. And if you go in and you cherry pick certain words, certain phrases, certain instances, certain people, certain blog posts, certain YouTubers, certain influencers, and say, okay, only consider these things, and I'm going to use this to argue my point, you're really uh, trying to pull the wool over the court's eyes in that case. Uh, and so I think it's important here that um, Torres has pointed out that the full scope of the situation needs to be taken under consideration. The whole, um, all the understandings, all the expectations, any contracts as a whole, the whole reality of the situation has to be considered and I think that that's one of the most important points being made because I don't think that's what the SEC was doing at all. I think they were trying to block uh, the parts that they didn't want heard and only enter 
the parts that they cherry picked to make their case, which is honestly fucking scummy. One more quote, just to beat a dead horse at this point. Each transaction must be analyzed and evaluated on the basis of the content of the instruments in question, the purposes intended to be served, and the factual setting as a whole. The court examines the totality of circumstances surrounding the defendant's different transactions and schemes involving the sale and distribution of XRP. I like that a lot because one of my biggest fears is that that wouldn't happen, is that the totality of circumstances wouldn't either be uh, investigated or considered or potentially understood. And the last part of it is, is the important part to me because you don't have to be necessarily uh, mischievous to not understand something. Um, so that's important. Moving on. Okay, we're a little bit more than halfway through here, and um, this is the first... Actually, we're exactly halfway through. We're on 17 of 34. Um, super interesting. Check this out. There is this word fungible again. This is why I took a little bit of issue with it early on in the um, thing. Um, right. So this is talking about the institutional investors. This is the first of the three or four cases that they're looking into. And the argument here, let me just find my place again. Ah, here we go. Each institutional buyer's ability to profit was tied to Ripple's fortunes, to Ripple's fortunes, and the fortunes of other institutional buyers because all institutional buyers received the same fungible XRP. So to me, this is saying that, and this actually does go on to say that their um, expectation of profit or whatever was based on uh, the percentage of their holdings going up and down, like their profits would be relative to the percentage of their holdings. Now, this is where um, looking a little bit into the future at, for example, Dragon Chain's case, those tokens were sold with the express expectation that they could be used to build software as a business, as a product, that, that they could could then profit from potentially, right? Whether they could solve some problem with or help their business somehow or or build things. They are literally uh, software licenses. So in Ripple's case, the judge is saying that there is no other use for XRP uh, that could be um, expected to make a profit for uh, the institutional buyers. In other words, they couldn't use it to make money or something. That they, that their um, their profit was tied to Ripple's fortunes and the fortunes of other institutional buyers because they shared this fungible token, which I think in the context of this, fungible is probably an okay word to use, even though I would still not use, maybe use a different word. Um, but yeah, so that's interesting because... If you consider um, the purpose of various tokens, and this is why each case is going to be different, um, the purpose of some tokens are to, for example, um, leverage some software that you have to run on your own, that you have to put in work, not in the work of others, but the work of yourself, to run and to operate, and you need this token as either a license to run that software, or you need this token as a uh, uh, like collateral leverage to reach consensus or, or consensus collateral to reach consensus in the network, um, and you can you can use it to make money to make a profit, but that is directly related to how you use it. Like if it's a screwdriver, right, or a wrench, or something like that, you can use those tools of the trade. If you know how to use them, if you're if you're if you're talented, if you're skilled in their use, you can use them to make stuff with, or you can use them to fix things, or you can use them, you know, as the tool that they are. So this is what 
this is where I think it's going to be interesting to see how Dragon Chain's case goes. Because Dragon Chain's tokens are literally software licenses and tools that you can then use, if you know how, to develop solutions and to build things that you could potentially profit from. But that doesn't mean that it's tied to the tokens of everyone else or to uh, Dragon Chains because the money that you would be making would be in in other money. You would be using it to make other money, not that the value of it would be going up and down. That's irrelevant because, um, yeah, it's just different. So it's interesting to read here that one of the reasons that there was um, that the institutional investments were found to be securities, I think, is what I'm going to end up reading here, is that the in this institutional buyer's ability to profit, and I'll just make my own notes here real quick, their ability to profit was tied to Ripple and other fortunes from other institutional buyers because all institutional buyers receive the same fungible XRP. I mean, I'm just reading that sentence over and over again at this point, but that's really interesting to me because that is not the case in every uh, every blockchain, every crypto project where, um, like that is the case, for example, that is the case for like Dogecoin, right? Um, Dogecoin doesn't do anything except exist. And so the only real way to profit from it is to buy low and sell high, that kind of thing. And that would that would be, you know, uh, shared with everybody else who is going to only profit from the value going up and down. But if it's a utility token that is a, a used for something, or if it's a, if it's merely like, like Dragon Chain is an ERC-20 encapsulated software license, it's like using um, the MP4 video container to hold an H.264 and AAC encoded uh, video uh, that you upload to YouTube. The MP4 container in this analogy is like the ERC-20 container. You can use it to encapsulate whatever software or software license or whatever you want. So they're different things, which means, well, I don't know what it means. I guess we'll find out, but it was worth pointing out. On to the next one. Another quote related to uh, investor, institutional sales rather, this category of sales. And this is from the Telegram case. The, the quote is, the success of the ecosystem drove demand for the digital token and thus dictated the investor's profits. Um, again, with the upcoming Dragon Chain case, the investor's profits would be dictated by their own business's success. In other words, if I bought a license to uh, Adobe um, Photoshop and Photoshop's stock value went down or something or their, their value went down, that doesn't mean that my expected profits go up or down because I'm not expecting to profit from the license that I bought, I'm expected to profit from as a business or a photographer from what I can use that software to create. And so it's a different case with Dragon Chain is exactly that. It's like the Photoshop analogy where you're buying a license to use software or Office 365, which you have to buy a license for every year to continue using to run your business. Um, in this quote, it says the success of the ecosystem um, dictates the investor's profits. But if I, as a business, invest in um, an office suite software license or a dragon chain license, a token, so that I can then use the software to build something or to run my business, my profits will come from my business success. It's my own business strategy and it's up to me. It isn't up to anybody else. So that's something that I expect to be um, hopefully thoroughly leaned on and explained in the courts where uh, the dragon chase the dragon chain case is being argued on uh, page 19 so in the past it's been argued by the SEC 
that even if one individual person takes it upon themselves to speculate on an asset and buy it for the purposes of an investment, that means that any of those uh, assets in that category are for investment purposes. This, from what I read, dismisses that uh, entirely and says the inquiry is an objective one focusing on the promises and offers made to investors it is not a search for the precise motivation of each individual participant I tend to like that because it makes sense and it's it's sort of grounded in reality that you can't hold all of humanity responsible for the motivations of one individual and here's where the court satisfies the third prong of the Howey test for institutional investors. It says here that from Ripple's communications, marketing campaign, and the nature of institutional sales, reasonable investors would understand that Ripple would use the capital received from its institutional sales to improve the market for XRP and develop uses for XRP Ledger, thereby increasing the value of XRP. So... I haven't read all of Ripple's communications and blog posts and their marketing campaign and stuff, but I do know that um, going back to Dragon Chain a little bit here, that their their marketing campaign, if you want to um, pick it apart and stuff, all of that was very clear about the uh, Dragon token being for being being a license to use the network, not being a, an investment or a speculative asset. Um, so I think that there's going to be a dramatic difference in where the court uh, used Ripple's communications and marketing <clears throat> versus how Dragon Chain really went out of their way to make sure that it was very clear. And there was, I remember reading it, it was very bold text, like, know what you're buying, this is something that you're going to have to use yourself, you're... You're buying a wrench here. You're you're buying a you're buying a a tool, or a software license, uh, or as they called it, a tokenized micro license, which it always has been. So, because the court leaned on um, Ripple's communications and marketing campaign to satisfy the third prong of the Howey test here, I'm hopeful that they'll do the same with Dragon Chain's case and look into the circumstances, the totality of circumstances and see if, um, as they say here, where is it, to do, to do, to do, if a reasonable investors would expect that they would derive profits from uh, Ripple's efforts to make the number go up. I think there's a clear difference there too. So I'm still sort of speculating myself on how this might apply to the case coming up at the end of this year, maybe the beginning of next year. Um, but I it seems interesting and, and, and applicable. Besides, I don't think there was any institutional sales with Dragon Chain anyway, so all those points might be moot. On to the next one. Uh, they, they, uh, the courts deemed the institutional sales as securities. Is, is the end of that. So yeah, this goes on to highlight specific instances in XRP marketing reports and Ripple's communications where they blatantly uh, said that their business model depends on the value of XRP, that they completely are um, not perfectly, but yes, closely aligned, um, that their interests are aligned with those of other XRP holders there's a bunch of examples here where they point out that Ripple was explicitly saying that their business model depends on the value of Ripple going up and down, that kind of thing. And um, I guess I'll just keep throwing in like differences with Dragon Chain and stuff. Dragon Chain's model is um, based on a uh, a knowable. Um, I forget how it's stated exactly, but basically they charge in in like. Uh, it doesn't matter what the value of the token is. And I think that that's important here because with Dragon Chain's model, they charge based on a stable, knowable, um, um, predictable uh, license fee model. So regardless of 
the value, the open market value of the token of their ERC-20 going up and down, they only charge a dollar amount, like a US dollar uh, equivalent fee for using the software. Meaning if the value of the token goes up, then they charge less of the token. If the value of the token goes down, they charge more of the token. So you might pay as a business who's using this license to run the software, you might pay, for example, one, let's say a half a cent US dollars per transaction that you make on the network. And if the value of the token goes up or down, you still only pay one half a cent per transaction. You just have to adjust the amount of the license that you're being that you're that you're sending through the network, the amount of the token that's going to to equal whatever a half a cent happens to be. So that's a big difference in here, where um, you know there's a there's like two pages of uh, leaning on all of this business model and communications of uh, Ripple depends on the price of XRP being going up and that they spend a lot of effort protecting the price of XRP uh, for that reason and that their interests are tied to the uh, holders interests and things like that that I think is very important because that is not at all how Dragon Chain's business model is um, if you look into like how Takara works and how they price uh, based on time uh, on you know applied to your business node and things like that. It's separate from it's separate from depending on the value of the token to go up. So very interesting. That's page twenty here that I'm on. It's interesting to me that the court is using um, chat chat logs, right? Chat room logs to uh yeah wild careful what you say in chat so in november 2017 schwartz posted on xrp chat that ripple would use its war chest to put upward pressure on xrp's price so they're using this as an example of messaging that is uh telling people that they're going to directly make the number go up interesting so yeah, all that's being used to um, represent Ripple's overall messaging to institutional buyers about the investment potential of XRP and its relationship to defendants' efforts. And I think that's the important part, the investment potential and its relationship to Ripple's efforts. Clearly, in the institutional buyers would have understood that Ripple was pitching a speculative value proposition for XRP with potential profits being derived from Ripple's entrepreneurial efforts. Um, again, a difference from the way that Dragon Chain is designed is that the potential profits, even if you are buying it speculatively, the potential profits are coming from um, the entrepreneurial success of businesses who are building on dragon chain so if they do well they're going to need to like let's say we're speculating oh you know what businesses might build on dragon chain and if they're successful then uh they're going to want to buy more tokens to pay their transaction fees which means i want to be the one selling them to that business right i want to be a broker i want to be somebody who's selling licenses um even if that's true like this is not based on Dragon Chain's work or Dragon Chain's success. It's based on Uber's success, or it's based on Whole Foods' success, or it's based on Starbucks' success when they build a network that's on uh, using using this platform. If those businesses do well, then yeah, maybe, maybe, who knows? Um, but this is directly tying the investment potential of XRP to the relationship of the defendant's efforts, the defendants being Ripple. So that is a difference. Um, just seeing a lot of differences, and so I just keep pointing them out. Oh, here's an important one. Um, institutional sales. <clears throat> the nature of the institutional sales also supports the conclusion that Ripple sold XRP as an investment rather than a consumptive use. In their sales contract, some institutional buyers agreed to lock up provisions for resale restrictions based on XRP's trading volume. So apparently there were literal contracts that um, pointed them being used 
not for consumptive uses, for speculative and for uh, there's agreements for price protection in there and stuff like that. So that's interesting to see. Wow, this is weird. Um, I didn't know this. So again, more of the written actual contracts apparently between Ripple and um, institutional investors expressly stated that the institutional buyer was purchasing XRP solely to resell or otherwise distribute and not to use XRP as an end user or for any other purpose. That seems bizarre to me, but I'm not, I guess I'm not familiar enough with, um, you know, their business model and their, their networks, uh, how it works, I guess, if that was necessary or not. But it's surprising me to me to see that there's an actual written contract with the sale to the institutional buyers that say you're not allowed to use these tokens for any purpose as an end user. You can only resell them. That I guess that's on them. I don't know what else to say. If that's if that's what that says, then that's what that says. If they if they put that in the contract with their institutional investors, I can I can only take it as stated here. Okay, we're done with the institutional sales and we're almost done with this whole thing. So the last sentence uh, in the institutional sales section, <clears throat> therefore having considered the economic reality and the totality of circumstances surrounding the institutional sales, the court concludes that Ripple's institutional sales of XRP <clears throat> constituted the unregistered offer and sale of investment contracts in violation of Section 5 of the Securities Act. So that section, uh, they are found to have violated the law. Now, let's go on to the other ones who, which seem a lot shorter. All right, so right off the bat, <clears throat> the SEC is claiming that even secondary sales and stuff that ex exchanges is sold on the exchanges uh, are securities and it's Ripple's fault and they should be held responsible for all the secondary sales in the world. The uh, court says that having considered the economic reality of the programmatic sales, the court concludes that the undisputed record does not establish the third Howie prong. So nope, not a security if it is in that case. Programmatic sales, secondary sales, blah -de blah they don't get that one. On page 23, um, there's a correlation or a, an equating of programmatic, programmatic buyers to secondary market purchasers, uh, basically saying they, they're, programmatic buyers stood in the same shoes as secondary market purchasers uh, who were just buying a token without regarding who it was coming from. Uh, they wanted the token. They weren't necessarily giving money to the ripple company so that they could invest it or something they wanted to even if they were speculating they were just buying it not not regarding uh it to be a contract between them and the company citing case law um there's a quote from a 1966 case that says a speculative motive on the part of the purchaser or seller does not evidence the existence of an investment contract within the meaning of the Securities Act. So that's pretty good and reasonable because you're saying, yeah, people speculate, but just because people are speculating on a classic uh, Ford Mustang doesn't mean that there's an investment contract between the Ford company and people that are speculating on their autos. Or in this case, Ripple and the purchaser of XRP. Um, yeah. It may certainly be the case that many programmatic buyers purchased XRP with an expectation of profit, but they did not derive that expectation from Ripple's efforts, as opposed to other factors, such as general cryptocurrency market trends. So what's being pointed out here, I think, is that somebody may have just invested in XRP because they're seeing crypto as a new asset class that they want exposure to. And they're like, man, all of crypto is going to go up. Uh, I better get me some of that. And so in that case, they're just looking at just the general trends of the market overall, saying that this type of asset class seems to be uh, people are buying it. I'm going to speculate in it because, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships, that kind of thing. That isn't an expectation of Ripple specifically making it go up. That's an expectation or a speculation that overall this whole industry is brand new and it, and it can only go up if it continues to exist. 
and that that isn't that isn't uh something that can tie you to the third prong of the howie test is what they're saying here i think further explaining the decision um here the record establishes here the record establishes that with respect to programmatic sales ripple did not make any promises or offers because ripple did not know who was buying the xrp in other words in a situation where you have um sale programmatic sales where anybody can come in and buy it you don't know who they are you don't necessarily care who they are you're just offering it for sale that offering something for sale to anybody who walks up to buy it is not an investment contract you can't make a contract with somebody when you don't know who they are uh is is what i'm reading here this is page 24 of 34 that i'm on Programmatic sales were not made pursuant to contracts that contain lockup provisions, resale restrictions, indemnification clauses, or statements of purpose. Here's a paragraph that I'll read in its entirety because I think it's great. Lastly, the institutional buyers were sophisticated entities, including institutional investors and hedge funds. An examination of the entirety of the party's understandings and expectations including the full set of contracts, expectations, and understandings centered on the sales and distribution of XRP, supports the conclusion that a reasonable investor situated in the position of in the institutional buyers would have been aware of Ripple's marketing campaign and public statements connecting XRP's price to its own efforts. There is no evidence that a reasonable programmatic buyer who was generally less sophisticated as an investor, shared similar understandings and expectations, and could parse through multiple documents and statements that the SEC highlights, which include statements that are sometimes inconsistent across many social media platforms and news sites from a variety of Ripple speakers with different levels of authority over an extended eight-year period. This is saying that, okay, the institutional buyers being sophisticated entities could reasonably be expected to have understood and read all the documentation and had an expectation of profit based on Ripple's uh, stated uh, whatever, right? And But even if that's true, that the same isn't, could not be reasonably expected of a programmatic buyer, uh, the general public, a uh, less sophisticated investor, somebody who wouldn't have the time or maybe even competence to read through all of the documents and follow everything for eight years on all social media networks and decipher who has what level of authority when they're speaking and all of that stuff, right? So they're saying that, um, yeah, for the general public, for programmatic buyers, uh, they can't be expected to have had the understanding that would uh, meet the third prong of the Howey test. That's a really interesting um, paragraph because it's kind of like saying, yeah, well, a lot of people are dumb. I don't know how else to put it. Okay, correction. It's not like saying a lot of people are dumb. It's kind of like saying you can't expect everyone to be as smart as an investor as the institutional buyers. I just wanted to clarify that. So having considered the economic reality and totality of circumstances, the court concludes that Ripple's programmatic sales of XRP did not constitute the offer and sale of investment contracts. That's probably why Coinbase and Kraken relisted XRP to U.S. customers. This second part right here. Because they're saying that, no, SEC, you're full of shit. And secondary sales on markets where nobody knows who they're buying from, who they're selling to, that kind of thing. You're just buying like bid-ask orders on a market. Those aren't uh, sufficient to constitute a contract, an investment contract, and meet the third prong of the Howey test. So, fuck all y'all, you only get so much denied. That's the important one, I think. That's super cool. I love that shit. That is great. That makes me that makes me want to stay in the U.S. a little bit. So the last part is the other distribution. This is where Ripple paid people in XRP as a currency for services. <clears throat> um, and this does not satisfy the first prong of the Howey test, where there is an investment of money as part of the contractor scheme. Uh, the Howey test requires showing uh, that showing the Howey requires a showing that investors provided the capital or put up their money um, or provided cash. 
and that didn't happen in this situation. They're just using XRP to pay people, and what they do with it with it is their own uh, their own thing. They can do what they want with it. It's decentralized. Take it, do what you want. The SEC is actually called out. Uh, again here, because the SEC claims that Ripple funded its project by transferring XRP to third parties and then having them sell the XRP. And as a factual matter, there is no evidence of that. Um, the record shows that the recipients of the other distributions did not pay money or some tangible or definable consideration to Ripple. To the contrary, Ripple paid XRP to these employees and companies. They just used it to pay them. So the other distributions doesn't satisfy the first prong. They are not securities. And um, I don't know. The SEC is called out for pivoting too and for being full of shit. So rock on. Hey, here's a good one. Larson's and Garlinghouse's offers and sales. The SEC is arguing that um, Larson and Garlinghouse personally sold XRP and that also violated securities law. They're arguing that uh, even though the uh, Securities Acts exempts transactions by any person other than an issuer, underwriter, or dealer, uh, the SEC is arguing that that exemption doesn't apply to Larson and Garlinghouse because they were affiliates of Ripple and an affiliate of the issuer uh, ordinarily may not rely on the section. So they're arguing that, and then the court basically says uh, none of that matters because like Ripple's programmatic sales, Larson's and Garlinghouse's XRP sales were programmatic sales on various digital assets exchanges through blind bid ask transactions. Meaning because we've already established that programmatic sales are not violations of securities, uh, personal programmatic sales are not violations. Of securities because again if you don't know who you're selling them to you can't have an investment contract with them they're just secondary sales on the open market and um, the issue of being exempt or not from uh, section 4 of the Securities Act the court not need reach this issue basically says fuck all that we've already said programmatic sales aren't a violation because of these reasons and so that extends to the personal sales of the office of uh, Garlinghouse and Larson. Cool. For the purpose of institutional sales, um, there was a there was a fair notice defense, which basically says that the law is unclear, and uh, the written law is uh, not able to be reasonably interpreted by somebody of average intelligence and that uh, they were never notified fairly that what they were doing was a violation. That was rejected in the case of institutional sales. The SEC's approach to enforcement, at least to the institutional sales, is consistent with the enforcement actions the agency has brought relating to the sale of other digital assets to buyers pursuant to written contracts for the purposes of uh, fundraising. So I, I, I like that they pointed out that in the case of institutional sales but because in other other cases they were being pretty ridiculous so anyway the uh, fair notice thing is dis is, is uh, rejected and the SEC's motion for summary judgment is granted for institutional sales otherwise denied and the defendant's motion for summary judgment is granted to the programmatic sales the other distributions and Larson and Garlinghouse's sales and denied in the institutional sales so they're on the hook still for institutional sales and they are, uh, the SEC lost their case on everything else. And the last thing is um, aiding and abetting. The SEC uh, claimed or complained that uh, Larson and Garlinghouse aided and abetted Ripple in violating the law. The court um, cannot find any evidence of that and basically says that uh, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary, including. Um, multiple foreign regulators, including regulators in Japan, Singapore, Switzerland, UAE, and the UK, determined that it was not a security. Uh, Larson and Garlinghouse had a reasonable understanding that because 
when the U.S. Department of Justice and the U.S. Treasury Department Financial Crimes Enforcement Network labeled XRP as a virtual currency. They understood that to mean that it wasn't a security. They also, um, un they also have uh, quoted Bill Hinman's speech here where uh, in the speech he said neither Bitcoin nor Ether were securities to further reinforce uh, that XRP was not a security. That was the SEC's position. In other words, there's a bunch of stuff here saying that um, there's nothing that shows that there was some um, uh, substantial assistance intentionally uh, given to break the law here, that they weren't intending to break the law. Maybe they did break the law in the institutional investor's case, but aiding and abetting requires that they understood what they were doing and that they were intentionally doing it, and none of that is shown in anything. So ordered. And that's it. So, I don't know. What do you think? What's interesting in there to you? I think that this really does um, bring the SEC back to reality a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of abuses. There's been a lot of overreach from the SEC. And from what I just read, they were put in their place a little bit. Um, the institutional investors thing, based on what is in that uh, order, it looks like there's you know enough there's enough uh, messaging and promises and contractual. There's literally contracts, right? So there's literally contracts, and so I guess those are investment contracts. Um, everything else, though, selling on a secondary market, programmatic sales where you don't know who you're selling it to, and you're just allowing anybody to buy it, um, selling it personally in the same way, using the token to pay someone for services or to pay employees. All of these things were deemed just now, just yesterday, not to be violations of the Securities Act. And that is the majority of the problem that people have had in the U.S. with the way that the SEC has been acting, because the SEC has basically been uh, trying to stifle innovation in favor of um, specific competitors who they, who people at the SEC have a personal vested interest in, then they they're they're manipulating the markets in every way that they can uh, from from what a lot of people are seeing, and so I hope that this can put a stop to a lot of that and it can provide um, some sort of uh, clarity into what is and what isn't allowed. So kudos to Kraken and Coinbase for re-enabling XRP sales to U.S. customers. Uh, it's the right move. Good luck to Coinbase on your case. Um, and go to legalfund.dragonchain.com to read about how you can support the rest of this fight. Because as plenty have mentioned already, we won the battle, but not the war. And there's plenty to do. Let's use this as momentum. And uh, thanks for listening to me go through and read something that I am uh, not an expert on legally. But that's how I interpret it. And that's my layman's read of, uh, of what just happened yesterday.